I'm Linda Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Did you know that 50 years ago, education was the number one major for college students? Since then, interest in teaching has dropped steadily. Careers in business, STEM, and even the visual and performing arts attract many more students. Teacher job satisfaction is at an all-time low, and school systems across the country are experiencing teacher shortages. What accounts for this shift, and why are current teachers feeling so burnt out? Today, EdCast examines the state of the teaching profession and what we can do to support teachers and attract a new generation to its ranks. Coming up now. I don't know a teacher right now that's not struggling. And I know a lot of teachers. I work with some of the most brilliant, incredible educators that you'll ever meet. They are open-minded, they are creative, they are collaborative, they are hardworking, and they are tired. Joining me today is Francie Alexander, Senior Vice President of Research at HMH, a leading edtech company. She leads their efforts to ensure that the company's programs improve student outcomes and teacher experiences. Francie's work is grounded in experiences of teaching students from kindergarten to college. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Edcast. Thank you. We've been hearing all about teacher burnout and that job satisfaction is low. Is this true and how do we really know this? Well, we just conducted the ninth annual Educators Confidence Report. So we have a pretty good readout on what the state of mind is of educators, especially teachers. And the numbers tell us that after an all-time low last year on a 100-point scale, teachers reported 40. They're up slightly two points at 42, but there's a way to go. Can you tell us how that report was conducted? Yes, it's done by survey, and it's meant, knowing how busy educators are, mm -hmm. it's meant to be quick, not taking more than 10 to 15 minutes. It is carefully constructed, so it's a national viewpoint, and special weighting on questions that have to do with how teachers are feeling about their profession. And what would you say about teacher confidence in their profession? Their confidence is waning. And an interesting thing happened right after, if you want to say the height of COVID, the teacher's confidence was at an all-time high. But then it plummeted to the low in the eighth annual, and then this year's slight recovery. And we think it might be the trajectory that we all rather experienced when our teachers changed what they did in one day or two days. Could you imagine? And I think there was a sense, we've got this. But then the reality set in of many fits and starts, of new challenges, unprecedented ones. And so I think that caused there to be this dip that we've experienced through our survey and we've been able to report on. Are teachers really leaving the profession? I mean, I know there are teacher shortages, but are they leaving in droves like they said they would? I think there's two things happening. One is we see less interest in joining the profession, many more alternatives. So that's one part of this story. And the other part is for now, the majority of teachers said they're staying, but they wouldn't rule it out. And then we have, I call them the bookends. We have a strong group, you could say in the 20 percentiles, who they're leaving. And then we have another in the 20s who are definitely staying. So I'm worried about in the middle where we're here, but we're not ruling out making a change. Now, the report, I believe, used the phrase that the current state of education was a recipe for burnout. Uh, why do you think that? Well, as we know, sometimes the more opportunities you have through new technologies, things that are occurring, that's a new learning curve. And then in addition to that, there has been the return for most teachers to be back in their classrooms with their students in person. And those children and youth from fourth grade up, they had an experience unprecedented in 
American education. So they're dealing with students who have needs they might not have addressed before, talking about things like trauma in a way they haven't before. And I think one thing we've all learned, the outside world comes in more quickly and more prominently than it may have before. Also, teachers seem to, I think the report had also mentioned that they're always on. What does that mean exactly? When you walk into the classroom, you are there to meet the needs of a variety of students in a variety of subjects if you're elementary, in a single subject if you're secondary, but, and you have to be on the lookout all the time. Who's listening attentively? Who doesn't look okay? Who looks like I'm bursting to tell you something? In 30 seconds, literally, you can go through a whole wave of emotions of your own because of what you're seeing registering on your students' faces and body language and all of those things. And then at a very basic level, are they getting it? <laughs> I'm teaching this skill. And are they there yet? So it's nonstop stress. It's nonstop. Would you agree with the teacher in the video, in the PBS video, when she said that she doesn't know a teacher who's not struggling? I mean, do you think that speaks to how most teachers feel? I think many teachers, and one of the things that came up in the study that hadn't come up as much before, our teachers have always articulated in the study how much they are concerned about their students, their students' feelings and their academic progress. But more and more they're reporting on their concern about their colleagues. And so I think that's an interesting turn. And starting to also want to think about themselves a bit. And I think sometimes we think in terms of our own children, our own family, we just think the teachers are just there for them. And we have to, I think, sometimes remember they have the same demands on their personal lives as we do. And they have a very challenging profession. They had kids to educate during the pandemic as well, your own children, and being home with, I, I know from my friends who were home with children, okay. negotiating Zoom, how difficult that was for parents. And if you're also working with your own class, it's very, very hard. So when we looked at the report and we tried to figure out what teachers were looking for, what are the things that they would like to see in the profession? I think one of the first things they're looking for is a work-life balance. And people talk about that in many professions, but I think teachers have more demands than if you want to compare it to anything else. I sometimes think of it, and my husband is an attorney, and I think, well, what if every one of his clients was in his office at the same time? <laughs> and he's trying to meet everybody's needs. Well, as a teacher, as you know, they're all there. And you don't get to take a quote case by case. And not only that, you're responsible from starting through kindergarten through college to see that they all work and play nicely together. That's a tall order. So they would like a balanced workload. If there are things that they would like, and what about their students? Are they concerned about their students? I mean, COVID brought out so many mental health challenges. And you um, alluded to the trauma that was happening. And, and I know many parents feel that those pandemic years were really harmful for their children in a lot of social ways. Um, do teachers want to see more support for, the, for their own mental health, for their students? Yes. One of the things when I work with teachers, and they laugh when I say it, I say, you know the advice that the airlines gives you on putting your own mask first? <laughs> right. Let's start with you. Um, wh where are you today? Where do you need support and help rather than my students need? And that's a hard concept for teachers. They always start with their students first. And sometimes you have to think about yourself so you can be there for others. Now, you didn't mention salary. And I would think that salary, considering that the level of education is so high and people with comparable levels of education make so much more, as we know, the studies are there. What did the survey indicate about how teachers felt salaries about salary. came up high on the list of what <laughs> they need and who doesn't and by the way in these economic times everybody's looking at the numbers and again when you think about the investment in terms of preparation for teaching and what they do day after day in addition to salaries so they're looking for things that i consider rather simple and we need to think about like what resources i mean 
think about other jobs. Recently, um, I was out of town and I stopped to get an iced tea and I like to look around for where I am. There was a sign about the town's teachers and they said, we're collecting these things for teachers, pens, pencils, paper. You know, I don't have to go to work and have somebody put up a sign saying, let's get some pens for her. Think about that. So I think we have to look at, be sure the teachers have the resources that they need. And there are studies that show teachers invest their own funds in terms of making things work. So I think we have to take a close look at that and be sure that every student has what the students need and every teachers have what the teachers need. I think that is such a good point because teachers really do foot the bill for many of the resources that they use in their classrooms. And I think people don't, people who work in other lines of work where those things, a pen, uh, a writing pad, or, you know, the supplies mm -hmm. that you need are there, don't even think that it could be that teachers in classrooms don't have those things that they need. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. I also want to ask you about today's political climate and the effect that it might be having on teachers. What do you think? There's so you know, Teachers seem to be in the middle of so much. Yeah, because child, when children... Um, bring in the outside. They bring in points of view that may put them at odds with others. I think one of the really important things that teachers are doing now is, yes, we may disagree, but we must do it without being disagreeable. Yes, there are things that are happening in the world, and as students get older especially, you have a responsibility to evaluate the sources you're listening to mm -hmm. and to not report on things that haven't been vetted and verified in the classroom. These are things that we have to teach. And we talk about our children being digital natives. Well, you know, they're, they're airplane natives, but we don't say you could be a pilot. So in terms of they have access to a whole world of learning, but I think teachers need support from the outside and in their own training to help young people navigate this world as it is. Are there areas, I mean, do we know um, the effects of having a community or district or supervisors that lend support? I mean, I know there's, I'm sure there's a variety and that there's yeah. a spread, but what do we know about how much teachers need support from the top down? Well, we also did a teacher ethnography once, one of the few that looked at a teacher's life dawn to dusk. <laughs> and one of the things, and we asked them after we had talked to them before COVID, and then we talked to them after, and it was the little things that made a difference. It was the administrative or the school community who had water or coffee or tea to welcome them back to the school. Something small, but somebody saying, we're glad you're back. It was having people help when the weather turned, shoveling snow so they could easily access their transportation. Sometimes it doesn't take a lot, but you need to know, I see you. I want to offer you all the support I can, and I appreciate what you're doing. And of course, the politics of book bans and how we should teach American history, do you think that really can weigh on teachers? And in my own experience in teaching, Let's talk about your experience, yes. all right? Tell and us when you I, were taught teaching and yes. what, what, what was it like for you compared to what you're seeing now? There weren't as many outside influences coming in. People used to talk about being able to close your classroom door. Well, now you might be able to close the door, but in a sense, the technology has opened up a window. True. So, so it has changed um, that environment. And also, though, we've always taught children who... I taught children who you weren't supposed to speak about. I was at grade levels where teeth were coming out. but And sometimes there used to be graphing how many teeth the classes lost. That wasn't to be talked about in certain cases. And so we learned how to navigate that. Taught in cases where some children didn't celebrate birthdays. So the marking of that. We talked about it as a community of parents and caregivers and teachers, how are we going to handle this? And how is that different from today? Sometimes I don't think we listen to each other and we don't try to find ways to accommodate each other. It's either you're wrong or right, rather than we're coming from different perspectives, 
but it's back to what I said before about we're teaching our children to work and play nicely together. Let's model that ourselves. Let's collaborate ourselves on solving this problem about this difference. How are we going to handle it? Were you teaching during the time of standardized testing? Oh, which yes. Which is now so prevalent. Okay, so what, what do you see as the effect of that on teachers? In some cases, some teachers believe they are being directed to teach toward the test. And, um, and one of the things that I've, I've argued for, I think a good curriculum, and I try to help teachers with their confidence, that a really good curriculum will prepare students for the test. Try not to overthink it, but think about what they need to learn to read the world. What do they need to learn to do the math that's necessary to function as a citizen and in any profession? Think about those things, but it is hard when some direction comes to just think about it as test preparation. I like to think about it that education and a good, solid education is the best test preparation. Do you think that teacher effectiveness should be based on test scores? I think it has to be on multiple factors. Like we say about our students, students should be evaluated not on just a single test, but on a body of work that they do, and on teacher interactions and observations, on portfolios that have been assembled and samples of their work. You want to get a total profile and picture of a student, and the same with teaching. You want to look at multiple ways of showing the effectiveness, including the teachers, and it's harder, um, but the teacher in terms of building relationships with students. I don't want to forget that while well, they do the math and teach them to read the word in the world. No, I want them also to have those relationships because one thing in my own teaching, I always remembered that I was going to be, my first job was teaching first grade, I was going to be their only first grade teacher. And at some point in their life trajectory, they'd be looking back, and my first grade teacher was. And, and are they going to know that they learned? Are they going to know that I cared? Is it going to have made a difference in their life? Will they see a book that they read to their child and say, my first grade teacher read that? Or my first grade teacher taught me to read so mm -hmm. I can read it to you. So I think that's an important part of all of this. Do you think there are too many demands placed on teachers to take on too many different roles? And it's a changing world. Yes. And there are things that come up in the classroom today yeah. that may not have yeah. been as prevalent as when you were teaching. Do we ask our teachers to be too much? I think we, we can give them more help and support through professional learning and development, through uh, resources like counselors at the schools and people that can be called upon to offer a team of support to students and their families. So I do think more resources are needed in general so that schools can be the hubs of learning and living that we want them to be. Are schools equipped right now to, hand, I know, to handle the um, home issues and emotional issues that students may bring to the classroom? And do teacher, are teachers asked too often to... To fill in some fill gaps, in, you yeah. might say. Um, I think we can take it from the point of view of what are, again, if we want a school to be a hub, if we want like community everybody, schools can be exactly. A hub. So there's some good examples of when you bring the resources together. Right. When I was teaching, simply having a dentist who looked at children and offering the services to do a first screening, a first look, made a difference sure. in terms of awareness. So drawing on the community, um, getting community resources, and again, talking to each other, not right. at each other or about each other. One of the biggest changes in the world right now is technology. Yes. Um, it's everywhere, and it certainly helped us a little bit during COVID, helped us a lot probably. Let's talk about artificial intelligence and how teachers feel about it and what you see as the role it might be having in the classroom for good and for bad. What do you think? Well, I'm hoping, you know, one of the years I was teaching, I had a teaching assistant. And I see some potential in it. Was a human. Yes, a yes. human teaching assistant. Oh, I, because I started in the no computer classroom. Um, and now we're one-to-one -one computer classrooms. Okay. So I've been through all the generations of that. And that was such a great up. I had another grown-up to mm -hmm. talk to about how the children did that day. And I had help with things like grading. 
And, and I can't even tell you how much I felt time it gave me for other things. So I think that we're seeing already some potential from AI, things like grading. Um, we have a program called Writable. And, and one of the reasons sometimes we don't assign writing is because we have to look at it. And no. we want to look at kids writing right away because we don't want them to go up there making errors, to make errors, or not to feel mm -hmm. that it wasn't important. Getting some help on that feedback makes a big difference. Are teachers comfortable with technology, and are, and are they comfortable with AI from what you can see? There are two, and they did some studies on that already. There, you're right. There are two answers. In terms of comfort with technology, off the charts. Really? Okay. And I think it, and they see its potential, and they have a sense that we really know how to use this. With AI, it was more tentative in this year's survey. Well, it's newer, I guess. Exactly. Right. So it was like not maybe planning to do much this year, but I think next year it will be more important. So the numbers went from the like the 20s to the 70s in terms of now and later. So I can't wait to do the 10th annual report because I think that might be a place where we see the biggest difference. Do you think um, we are beginning to close what has been called the pandemic learning gap? Um, I think now that children are back, and in some cases there were some children who weren't, do, you know, look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress with the nation's report card. There were many children not doing so well before. So I'm hoping that we look at this as not just closing the gap or going back, but accelerating our students to literally be a new generation of learners. We've learned a lot. We do have new resources. And I think if we use them well, the high tech ones and the high touch ones, like the coffee or the snow mm -hmm. and talking to each other, that I think we can have the time of an education that our students deserve. We're running out of time, so I want to ask you a key question. How can we attract a new generation of teachers? I think that we really can look at the basics, look at how are we in terms of salary, how are we in terms of job requirements, how are we in terms of work-life balance, and then also look at the aspirational parts of it and the rewards. And I think we need to speak more about, first of all, Almost everybody has had a teacher who's made a difference in their lives. And having the opportunity to be that person in a life or lives How will is you unprecedented. Sell this to a generation that is avoiding teaching. We don't have much time, but that, yeah. that's fine. But how are you going to sell that? Maybe we need to talk about these experiences that we share now in terms of our students and our own teaching. And Do we need talk to change about anything basic in the get profession it, to attract more people? Getting at the basics. Okay. Let's take care of the basics. Let's be sure that teachers are rewarded as the profession, the important profession that they so are. Their salary take care of the basics, yes. And the basics to you would be? Salary. salary? Work conditions. You know, like we talked about having the resources that you need. And also, then there is the... and then. Part of it is the respect and, and remembering, again, in your own learning, what teaching meant to you, what teacher meant to you, and just a kind word occasionally goes a very long way. Thank We're completely out of time. Thank you so much, Francie Alexander, for giving us some insight into what teaching looks like today and how we can help improve the lives of our current teachers and attract a new generation. So thank you so much. Don't go away, we'll be right back with our Ed Bites. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. We all have buzzwords and jargon we're tired of hearing, and educators are bombarded with lots of them. So what are the words that make educators cringe? To find out, the Ed Week Research Center polled educators nationwide and ask for their least favorite education-related buzzwords. Here are the top 10. Number 10, COVID. Do we need to say more? Number nine, woke. This is meant to call attention to awareness of societal issues. Conservatives, however, have given this a pejorative spin. Number eight, fidelity. This refers to how closely a program or curriculum follows its original design. 
teachers often see it as an unrealistic goal. Oh, and it's sometimes called the F word of education jargon. Number seven, data driven. I hear this one a lot. Data seems to be driving everything, often at the expense of more nuanced measures. Number six, standardized tests. The topic is still here, even if many want the tests to go away. Number five, differentiated instruction. This refers to adapting lessons to individual students' strengths, needs, and interests. Teachers, however, see it as asking them to be all things to all students all the time. Number four, equity. Education Week says no one said why this was a least favorite. But the guess is that people have different ideas about what an equitable school system looks like. Number three, learning loss. Educators feel this term is too deficit focused and ignores what students may have gained during the pandemic, such as resilience. Number two, social emotional learning. What's not to like? It's meant to support students, especially their mental health well-being. Conservatives say that CEL promotes liberal values in schools. Either way, educators are getting tired of hearing about it. And number one, rigor. It's least favorite because teachers feel it's been used against them to push students to catch up academically. And there were more. Here at EdCast, we're tired of paradigm shift and agency though I'll probably be using both of them soon. What are some of your least favorite education buzzwords? We'd like to know. Tell us at cuneyedcast at gmail.com. That's it for this edition of EdCast. Thanks for watching. And see you next time. like to hear from you, please send your thoughts and comments to cuneyedcast at gmail.com.